Now to the topic of the hour. I learned about Sankofa Community Farm through one of our PFI vegetable farmers who followed them on social media. And I think the spirit and the story of their farming community will resonate with many of our farmers and seed keepers. And I'm excited to learn from Ty's experience um, and, and what he can, can uh, share with us that we can bring from Philly back to, back to Iowa. So without further ado, Ty, I'll let you take it away. Cool. Thank you so much. And welcome, everybody. What's up, Iowa? Uh, my name is Ty Holmberg, and I am coming to you uh, live here from the Sankofa Community Farm at Bartram's Garden in Southwest Philadelphia. Um, I want to thank Liz uh, for hosting, and I also want to thank the Iowa Practical Farmer Conference for um, thinking of us and inviting us uh, to be able to come and speak. So we're going to get into a little bit more about the topics of community engaged seed keeping um, and the practice of Sankofa, uh, which is like part of what we'll be discussing today. Uh, we also will be discussing kind of this idea of how agriculture and urban agriculture can actually be vehicles for what I found and what we found in the past 10 years here at Sankofa for self-reliance, um, for healing, for conversations across race, um, for youth development. Um, and we can, we also, I think um, we have found that, I think one of the major lessons that we have found here is that um, there are few better kind of vehicles for, for having these hard and deep conversations than working hard together on the land um, and, and also sharing food together and, and working with young people and intergenerationally. So um, I'm happy to share those lessons with you today. I was taking some time to kind of think about uh, how to do this virtually. Um, I love to interact with audiences. And so if you do have a, conversa a conversation piece or a question, um, we'll pause throughout the, the session so that Liz can, can relay that on to us um, because it's really important. Uh, Philadelphia is much different than Iowa, obviously. And I, and I have been following and I've seen that there's been some initiatives recently, um, especially in the cities to do some food security panels in Des Moines and things like that. Um, so I am really curious on how this translates to Iowa. Um, and I think part of doing that and kind of sussing that out will be you guys really asking the questions that make sense to you as we go along. So please drop those questions in the, in the, in the chat. Um, so I would love for you guys to walk away at the end of this time uh, feeling a little bit inspired, hopefully, by the work that we do um, and that you get a chance to understand our programs a little bit more. I also, I think that there's sometimes when we talk a little bit more about rural farming um, versus urban farming, uh, especially here in PA, uh, it's, there's been a little bit of a battle to prove that uh, we as farmers are also doing the, the work here in the city. And I would love for you to, to get a feel for that, what that is in Philadelphia. Um, and I'd also like to have you guys learn a little bit about the, the difference between seed keeping and seed saving, um, and at least be able to share one of, uh, or get to know one of your seed stories. So that's what I would love for you to, to get uh, to walk away when this hour is up. Um, and uh, you'll notice that throughout the session, I've peppered some pictures of the different uh, crops that we actually have seed saved along the, the last year or so. So right here, we're looking at a beautiful hill country red okra that we grow um, right here in Southwest Philadelphia. It's hard to believe, but okra does grow really well here. Um, so thanks again for participating with us. I look forward to talk with you the next hour and we can go to the next slide. So before we get uh, too started, here at Sankofa, we are a, a spiritually rooted farm. Um, it's important for us to take uh, some time to set intention. Um, and that's how we start all of our meetings and all of our youth development programs uh, is with that 30 seconds of silence or some type of um, centering. And so uh, we'd like to, I'd like to get started before we start you know, get, jump in too much. Let's get started with 30 seconds of silence. And if you guys can just join me in that time to just be thinking about the last thing you ate, whether that was a bagel this morning, whether that was some coffee or uh, maybe some eggs, and just kind of trace that back in your mind uh, to, to that it, it came from the land at, at some point um, and just kind of hold that whole, that whole like chain of, uh, of that food system back to the land uh, as we take 30 seconds of silence.
All right. Thank you. Um, I'd also like to take this chance to acknowledge. Um, so the, a lot of the talk today is going to be about the work of Sankofa. Um, here in Southwest Philadelphia, we are an African diasporic centered farm. It didn't start off like that. Um, in fact, the origins of the farm were much more focused on production and uh, less on like cultural connections. And through the journey of the last 10 years and alongside uh, who I work with every day, our co-director, Chris Bolden Newsom, who is from Mississippi, uh, and I am from upstate New York, we kind of came together and, and, and built this program. Um, we started and kind of started, we started out kind of with an agenda that was much more outside the community. We were working for the University of Pennsylvania. And... Uh, we really developed systems to be able to listen fully and authentically to the community. And part of that listening was us really transitioning and switching our vision and to be very um, directed by the folks right here in Southwest Philadelphia. Um, and a lot of those folks, 90% uh, of those uh, people are African descended. Um, so in order to kind of move forward before we, you know, really jump into the presentation, I just wanted to acknowledge that um, I am one of the only white staff that's on uh, our work. I am going to be talking about a lot of African-American cultivars. Um, I feel really honored to be able to do this work in a Black community. Um, and I think part of that work that I've learned to do and working in a community that um, was not my own, me being from upstate New York, uh, was really learning to listen. Um, but also learning the history uh, of the population and people that I'm working alongside of. And, um, and then also what we'll be talking about later is a little bit about what Sankofa can mean for white folks and going back and understanding their own cultural history um, to, to kind of dismantle white, whiteness in general. So I just wanted to, before we go too far, just acknowledge um, the, the teachers that I've had uh, that are in this community and that I'm doing a lot of translating here today, um, and that uh, I just wanted to put that out there before we get uh, jump in too much. So we can head to the next slide. Thank you. All right. So um, before we go into seed keeping and the process of seed keeping and seed uh, saving, I wanted to talk a little bit about where we are and where we come from. So uh, Bartram's Garden is a really cool space. It's nestled within the city of Philadelphia. It's on 54th Street. Um, it's 50 acres right along the Schuylkill River. And actually, John Bartram uh, came to this land in 1699. He, uh, he established a farm um, and actually a pretty vibrant plant business. This is known as the first botanical garden in, in the country. And um, so there's a lot of history to this space. Uh, about 10 years ago, uh, Sankofa Community Farm, uh, we got started. And we're on about five of the acres of Bartram Garden. So we're, we're public land. And we're at urban farm, so we have five acres, um, and that space is broken up, and we'll see a little bit later, broken up into a community garden, a two-acre farm, a greenhouse area, a, a education space, and an orchard. Um, and so that's a little bit about kind of the history where we came from. And before that, this land was all Lene Lenape, um, the the indigenous people of the of this area. Um, kind of cohabitated and, and lived in this space. Um, and I want to introduce a little bit about um, Sankofa so we can head to the next slide. So Sankofa, and this here is Taikia. We actually have a youth development program. Taikia worked with us for three years. Uh, she went on to get a full ride to college. And uh, here we have, this is a, at one of our presentations of learning. Um, Sankofa is a West African word that means, it's from the tree language, it's an adinkra symbol. And it means to go back and get it at the same time and simultaneously like as you're moving forward. Um, so this idea for us really, really resonated and, and uh, it became kind of our, it, it has become our identity as uh, the work that we're doing is not just thinking about progress and moving forward, but we are deeply engaged in understanding um, the history of the land and specifically the history of, of Black folks um, and African descended folks through the South and then back to West Africa. Um, 
one of the most beautiful things that I think we do is that Chris teaches this new urban freedom school curriculum. And you start to see these young students uh, as they understanding their history and we going deep into the histories of, of resistance and actually going hard into um, the very difficult history of the last 400 years here in the United States, we see that we see that the young people start to really like gather energy um, around who they are. Um, and then their ability to ask questions and move forward within that has been something that has uh, really kind of identified, like really uh, created identity for who we are. Um, so Sankofa, like I said, means go back and get it, um, speaking to history. And here we have a goose, um, which you can see in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, that is the symbol, the Adinkra symbol. It's often represented like that. And it is a, she is, she is walking forward at the same time. And it's generally an egg on the back and we switched it to a seed um, for our uh, purposes. Before I move any further out, Liz, I wanted to know if there was any questions in the chat yet. How are we doing? We're, we're doing Not fine. Yet. Not yet. Feel, feel free, to, feel free to, to ask away. I know it's really hard for me. I usually have jokes and I, I can't see if they land. So Liz, you got to tell me if, um, if I'm funny or not. Uh, but, so, uh, feel, so hilarious. You're so doing hilarious. Great. Okay. <laughs> we're going Love to the, the next, energy. No, next slide. Next slide. So in this next slide, it's really hard to bring you to, to kind of have this conversation about the work. Um, we had a video created about uh, a couple of years ago that is going to, uh, we're going to play right now to really bring you to this, to what we do. Um, so we can roll that video. It's about three or four minutes. Um, so please enjoy. Yeah, and I just uh, will remind folks before I play that, and actually I'm going to fix my screen share so that I can make sure I am getting the video correct with the sound on. Um, but the, uh, the question and answer is happening on the session page, not in the Zoom chat. So if you pop that into Zoom, make sure that you're using the session page chat uh, where there's some conversation going on. So, okay, and here we go for the video. Looks like my computer's a little angry at playing this. I'm a Philadelphia native. As an educator, I've bought children to Bartram's Gardens many times. But the pride that I feel in Bartram's effort right now is that they are opening this historic place to the community. And the Sankofa Community Farms is a part of that opening. What I see as the mission of Sankofa Farm is to uh, connect our community elders, youth, and families, restoring that critical, integral, and deep relationship with the land and with the earth here in their neighborhood. Wow. Mm. Good. As well as uh, connecting folks with resources uh, in order to create situations of sovereignty, of self-reliance, and that speaks to more than just the food system. We're interested in, f in folks connecting to their history through the food. We really work a lot to provide a space for people to get to organize and meet each other so that this can be an opportunity for people to organize and start to build power in the community so that they can start to have control back of their food system. When I first got here, it was an unexplored territory for me. So it was like making discovery after discovery after discovery. And it was exciting, it was really, really exciting. We are the future, you know, we're, we are the next community leaders. Those are mine. Me and another student planted those over the summer. I feel like, like I'm their mom. I feel like a plant mom. It's awesome. I get, get to watch them grow up and soar. 
We have a farm stand. Every week we come out from 3.30 to 6.30 to sell our organic food. But our goal is not to create wealth from this market. Our goal is to create wealth in the well-being of the members of the community. So we're selling them fresh, organically picked food. The farm stand is our primary point of connection between our community and the food that's grown here. The mission is really about education, introducing them to some of the cultural crops that are specific to people of African descent, like the okra that we grow here, and showing them that it can be affordable to, to eat our cultural foods that, you know, are very nourishing to our souls and help connect us to our history. Thank you very, Thank very you. much. So that's really the story, connecting this community through this space to one another, to the land, to the resources that folks need in order to grow self-reliance where they are. And that's what we want to do. We want people to have relationship with the garden at Bartram. This is awesome, kids. Yeah. Because yeah, folks are hungry for it, you know. It, it's, it means the difference between our psychic and in a lot of ways physical survival. The name is Sankofa, which comes from language in the Akan culture, meaning ain't nothing wrong with going back and getting what you left behind. Then we move forward by remembering our past. <laughs> All right, we're going to bring you guys back to the presentation. I hope you enjoyed that. Um, as you heard from different members of our community and our other staff members, so you got a chance to see Chris and Kiana. Uh, so much of our work is, a, is about relationships and the relationships with each other and the relationships with our land. And um, like I said earlier, that kind of progression from originally being all about access to then being about relationships um, was, has, been, has been a really beautiful thing for us. So um, our values uh, that we have created are that we are African diasporic centered farm, um, meaning, not meaning that you know, all, the, the farm is for everyone, but specifically we are there for folks in the community and African descended people to come um, to the space uh, to get connected to their, to their traditional crops. And we're gonna be talking about those crops a little bit later, um, but it's very hard to get things, especially in the North, like okra, black eyed peas, um, certain types of butter beans. We grow these things uh, and we tell their story. And they're not just commodities or crops for us, um, but they, they do provide, their stories do provide a connection to their cultural traditions um, that has really amazing and um, important healing uh, powers. So um, we are African diasporic. We also teach our young people um, through what's called the African Heritage Diet Pyramid, um, which is different from my plate. And there's a really cool curriculum that I wanna suggest. It's called Old Ways. We found that working with young people, it isn't just about growing the food, but it is, it's also about having a culinary tradition and uh, a cultural tradition to the work that we're doing. So we, uh, we harvest and accrue during the summer. We have uh, the students rotate around having um, a, a farm experience, having a cooking experience, having a special project. So they're doing like the flowers, berries, and carpentry. And then our students also do a week in the farm. And they're, the, the students that are in the cooking crew get a chance to learn about this African heritage diet pyramid um, as opposed to my plate. So for example, on the African heritage diet pyramid, there is not milk as there are as on, in my plate. The, you know, the history behind that is that there were not cows on the African continent, and therefore it's very difficult for a lot of African-American folks to digest you know, the, the certain proteins in milk. 
uh, and, and the different sugars. And so um, there are different things that are, that are geared towards the way that people have been eating for, for generations. Um, and they also have this old ways curriculum also has this different pyramids for different cultural backgrounds. Um, so I encourage you to look that up. That's a great resource. Um, also that we are in an intergenerational farm, um, especially in this day and age where we are so uh, kind of in, insular, especially in our cities. And I wish it was different. Different, um, the elders kind of hang out with elders, young people hang out with young people. We really encourage the intergenerational relationships and the wisdom um, that comes out of uh, the, the elders and then the energy that comes out of the young people. And so we do work uh, along stories, uh, storytelling and interviewing. Um, and that's kind of part of our programmatic themes. Um, we are also a, a spiritually rooted farm. Um, we follow the practices of um, no-till, but even more so we follow the practices out of the Shumei Institute in Japan around natural agriculture. I really encourage you to look this up. Um, it, it, we do not till our land and we haven't tilled uh, our, our beds for I think six years now. Um, and the practices of natural agriculture are also constant cropping, but it's all about relationships, not just to the, to the land, but also to the seeds, which we're gonna be talking about later. Um, and, and it also goes into the, one of the reasons why we do seed keeping is for, to really create land races. Um, so we have seeds that we've grown now for six years that are used to the, the climate, um, that are used to the soil, um, the body of the soil, the makeup of, of the soil. And we see uh, increasingly higher yields as we're doing less tilling. Um, we're doing more uh, cover cropping and we're doing more um, just implementing things like chip leaves and using weeds as mulch. We mulch, mulch, mulch. Anyway, uh, other ways that we're spiritually rooted is that we pray a lot together. Um, not from any specific uh, background, um, but we have found, especially to work across uh, different racial backgrounds and different cultural backgrounds, when things get really hard, we have found that it, it is only through spirit that we're able to connect. Um, and there's actually a really amazing story that we'll talk about a little bit late. I'll actually talk about it now. Um, there is an African rice uh, called the Moruga rice, and it was uh, eaten all through West Africa. It's a dry rice, and it was actually grown here in the United States. Um, but it was it was lost. Um, it was it was eaten all over the place, and then uh, after I think in the, around the eighteen in late eighteen hundreds, it, it was lost. No one could find where this rice was, um, and it wasn't until the story was that um, there were some uh, African Americans who who made a deal uh, to fight on the side. I believe it was the side of the Spanish. Um, oh no, or the side of the French, and they, uh, if they, you know, if they, if they did that, then they would get um, free from enslavement and and be able to live in Trinidad. These folks were called Maroons. Um, that's kind of the cultural group of which they uh, were named. Um, so one of our friends had a friend in Trinidad and they actually found the rice there. We were one of the first farms um, to be able to kind of regrow this rice and it didn't come up the first year. Um, and then it wasn't until the second year where Chris, the co-director and I actually prayed over the rice um, and were able to, uh, it was really a very special moment where we prayed together over it and let the, let the rice know that it was okay to come up and uh, the next year it came up uh, and was beautiful and made seeds and we were able to keep seeds from it. Um, and so that, now that rice is being re, uh, regrown um, and hopefully we can have enough to actually incorporate it and tell that story. Um, so that's one example of how we're spiritually rooted. Next slide. All right, so our guiding goals are access, self-reliance, and food sovereignty, um, and also relationship and healing. So we talk about access, and we often talk about, I, there's all this conversation around food deserts. We actually don't use that term for food deserts. Um, we, use the food, we use the term food apartheid. Um, we do that because the, the 
access or the limited access that a lot of folks have in the city to healthy local nutritious food, um, ha it, we found that that's not that hasn't just that just doesn't happen. That has been an intentional process and has often been significantly um, built because of systems of power. Um, and so we want to call that out through using the term food apartheid. Food desert, we stay away from. Um, Food desert was also a term that kind of was brought uh, in from outside of the community um, and kind of in academic terms. And also we believe that deserts have this, have a thriving e ecosystem. Um, so that's just one of the things that we do. And I encourage you to look up uh, more about food apartheid versus food deserts. We talk about access, not just in terms of proximity to food, but we talk about access in terms of affordability, culinary access and cultural access to food. And um, so we address those all at our farmer's markets where we sell our, our food. We also um, wanna provide a space for tools for self-reliance. And we talk about this idea of food sovereignty versus food justice. Um, we believe that everyone has a right to food and a good healthy food, just like people have a right to healthy, clean water and clean air. And I'm not sure how, how it is in Iowa, but here in Philadelphia, we actually do a walk um, we have the University of Pennsylvania here, right here in, in West Philadelphia on about 40th Street. And we do a walk with our students from 40th Street all the way to 54th Street. And we see how the food options change. Um, and it's so, it's so drastic. Um, there are no organic options in the grocery stores. There are no local options. The food quality is much less, like there's much less quality. There are flies around, like in just 14 blocks. Um, and this is, deeply, deeply connected to the racial and socioeconomic um, makeup and demographics of both of the neighborhoods. And so that's one of the reasons why we're doing this work is to hopefully break that down. Um, and uh, so this idea of food sovereignty is that people have control over their food system. Um, so that's, uh, we're kind of hopefully moving towards that. Um, and then again, we're about relationships and healing. Um, this is hopefully be a space for people to learn how to connect and build relationships to each other and the land. Next slide. Hey, and, and uh, Ty, before you get any, any further right now, um, and while people are looking at this slide, I just want to uh, relay a few questions for okay. you specifically related to uh, relationship building. Yeah. And um, the challenges and successes with you know, getting community involvement since you came in um, as, you know, outsiders in the community. Yeah. And particularly you as a, as a white person coming in. Yeah. And then another one about um, incorporating the elders. And I know that you may have a slide on that later um, to touch on that. And in the cool. third question, I think relevant to this portion is how do you do get people of different beliefs to pray together and, and any mm. practical advice on that front? Wow. Those are great questions. Um, I'll tackle the first question. Um, I would say as a white person coming outside of the community, if I was to do it again, uh, knowing what I know now, I pro like, I, and I encourage other farmers that are coming into the city to really, to really make sure that they uh, are in a space where they are here to do some system be beating and some uplifting of leadership of folks who live in the community. And so, um, I came in like 10 years ago. I was like, yeah, I want to start my own nonprofit. Like I want to, you know, it was very pioneery. And like, I didn't really know exactly what I was doing. And I knew that I was, I now I know now that I was taking up a lot of space. Um, and now I'm using my privilege and my kind of connection to other places within the city, my ability to raise money to hopefully uplift and create jobs for other people. And so one of the things I would say as a white person moving in and working or someone not being in their community, I would say the first thing is just to really listen, um, to really create pathways for listening. Um, there's also an extreme need for consistency. We have had uh, so many white folks in the last like 10 years that are in the farming networks here in Philadelphia move in and out, in and out of nonprofits for many different reasons. One, because our nonprofits system is really kind of messed up with our funding and our crabs in the barrel and looking for uh, full-time positions. Um, but consistency again and again, I think for the first, uh, for the first couple of years, um, 
I, everyone was like, oh, there's that guy is going to cut, you know, but I, I've been here for now for in Philly for 15 years and I've established relationships. Um, and because of that consistency. So that's a really huge part. Um, I think understanding and knowing the people that you work with and knowing their history is really important. So you need to do the work to research and know the history of the people that you're working with. Um, and I would say like, what I found is like share, sharing, this is like a very kind of like have fun, share food together. Um, and I think that there's, and, and, and this has been the beauty of farming is that like when you work together with someone and you share food, there is an amazing magic that happens in doing that. Uh, and you start to kind of create and build those relationships. And some of those walls that are very systemic start to kind of break down. Um, but I would also say, Hiring young people is one of the best things that I can, like if you can find money to hire young people, um, it's a slower process, but it is a deeply um, trust building process to hire young people, provide great programming, and then their families start coming, their neighbors start coming to the space, um, their sisters or brothers enroll in the program. Um, and then they also are gaining, they're also gaining, they're having, they're, they're making money. Um, so that's been a huge thing. We hire as many community members as we can. We hire them. We pay them for their, we have a community leadership board. We have a community elders board. Um, and we, we provide compensation for their wisdom. Um, so I just want to say that. Uh, there's a lot more, but that's, you know, some of it. I play basketball with, you know, in the community, right here in the community. I, I live here too now. So um, that's been some big, big things. That was the first question. Liz, can you help me with the second question? Sure. So, um, well, the second question is about the elders, and I think uh, that you have a specific slide on that later. So maybe we'll okay. wait on that. We'll hold on that. Yeah. Yeah. And then just the other one, uh, a practical tip you can give about um, having people of different beliefs pray together. Right. Um, so we, so Philadelphia is a, a large uh, Muslim population and several of our students um, and our staff members are um are Muslim. And uh, when we pray, so we, we never subscribe to one, one, uh, one religion, I think, when we're praying. Um, we try to also bring in a, connect, you know, a connection to the land. And as it is, it, we ask people to come who, how they pray, how they pray, right? So, um, and then we don't, um, we, we just encourage all of that. For us, that is like lifting up for us, a lifting up the creator and lifting up God. Um, and we also encourage people that don't believe in God to, and I think this has been led through Chris, is that, um, and he would say that Black folks, when they do work like this, are doing it through spiritual work. That is part of their cultural practice. And if you're going to come to the farm, that is, you know, you might not need, you don't might not have to pray, but you, we are encouraging you to to be part of the space when that's happening and uh, whatever your tradition is to bring that. Fantastic. And there are some more questions, but they're kind of more related to the, the seed uh, seed keeping side. So I'm going to let you continue okay. on. We're about to jump into that. And thank and, you for yeah. bearing. I'm going in hard on the programming because I want you to really know who we are before we jump in, um, because that really does inform what seed keeping is for us. Mm -hmm. So um, this is our space. You got a chance to see it in the video, so I'm not going to take too much. But um, our programs, um, our, our land really gives life to our programs. Um, so we have youth programs. We work with 24 high school students during the summer. We also have a year round program and students can come back. Um, it is the lifeblood of our work uh, to work with young people. Our community programs I'll talk about a little bit later, but they are uh, vast. We work with rec centers and school gardens. Um, we work with, uh, we started a home garden bed program, which has been so awesome in COVID. And I wanna share as much as I can with you guys about that, how to build home gardens at home as a way. To, and we actually, the youth go and install these beds their front yard gardens, people are growing food at home and then using our farm in the community as a resource and an educational hub. So it's really cool. But here, as we look at the space, this is what it looks like. And I would love any of you Iowans, if you ever come to Philadelphia, please come to Bartram Garden. Just say that you're a practical farmer. 
and I'll be like, you're in. Well, you'll get the VIP tour. Uh, here we go. So we got our greenhouse space. We work with a really cool program uh, through the Pennsylvania Horticulture Society. Half of the greenhouse is used to support the 140 community gardens throughout the city of Philadelphia. They're resourced six times a year with little baby seeds. Um, you know, they come in, this is a distribution hub. This one of four greenhouses throughout the city. It's a really cool model. If you're ever interested in really uh, having your city or your region support urban ag, it's a really cool model. It's called City Harvest at the Pennsylvania Horticulture Society. So we have about a 60 foot uh, greenhouse and nursery up here. Uh, community uh, garden bed is to your right. We have 60 beds. Each bed represents a community member who's learning how to grow their own food. This is where we do a lot of our intergenerational work. Um, we have uh, a lot of elders that are here in the community. And uh, so um, it's about $20 for them to, to be, to grow their own food. We have monthly classes. So you're kind of paying into a membership um, and it's very relationship based. We can, we uh, go through like, why is this beetle eating my food? You know, we go through like the, the technical assistance part, but it's also very much sharing food together. Um, we have a 140 tree orchard. Um, it's a demonstration orchard about basically uh, what you can grow at this temperate zone. So there's like education is really, really threaded throughout all of our work. Um, like I said, we, we wouldn't be doing our work. And I think what makes us a lot different from, from many other urban farms is that we have a strong uh, culinary uh, program. We actually have a culinary and cultural coordinator as one of our staff members who leads the work. Um, this summer during COVID, she taught online cooking classes um, that were connected to food from the African diaspora. And then we have our crop field. All right, we can head to the next slide. How are we doing on time? Oh my gosh, we gotta go. Yeah, I was just gonna mention that to you as okay. well. So you got 25 minutes. You guys got 20, me going, you guys got me minutes. going. Okay, here we go. Uh, so seed keeping uh, here at Sankofa. So seed keeping versus seed saving. Um, seed keeping is, is the process of keeping the physical keeping of seeds, but you're also keeping the story. Um, a lot of the work that we've done been, it has been informed through our work with this uh, program um, and business called True Love Seeds, which we will talk about next. But the main difference when you're asking seed saving is the physical, like, um, I want to save my seeds so that I can pay not have to pay for a next year. Seed keeping is that story, that beautiful cultural story where you got the seeds from. It, may, it brings the Sankofa, it br brings the history and the story to the work and the practice of seed keeping. So why do we keep seeds, right? Um, you guys might know the answer to this. We do it because of our, our belief in our relationship to the seeds. Uh, we believe that by keeping the cultural story of the seeds, we are also uh, keeping the story and culture so we're not forgetting. This day and age, and I know you probably as farmers know that seed, the seed libraries are, are getting completely, uh, like they're getting, they're, they're almost empty right now. Everyone's trying to grow food. Um, this is a way for you to keep your own seed so you don't have to rely. And there's some sovereignty uh, based uh, in it. Um, we also believe in the connection to the land. So this is you're, you're creating your own land race. You're also able to create networks so you can share seeds. Um, I encourage you to do local seed swaps. Uh, we do that here at the farm. And that's a, a great way to keep the genetic diversity in a, in a world where uh, GMO and GMO corn and everything is happening and we're getting less and less diverse. This is keeping the genetic history and it's also um, allowing us to keeping the, those open pollinated plants um, so that we can, you know, we can sow those open, open pollinated plants so that we can uh, keep, the, keep those, those beautiful um, heirloom seeds. So um, we can head to the next slide. All right, this is True Love Seeds. Really encourage you to go see it, trueloveseeds.com. Um, Owen Taylor and Chris Bolden Newsom, my co-director started this company. Um, they contract out with about 20 different farms, urban and rural farms. Um, those farms grow their own cultural crops. So at Sankofa, we grow uh, generally West African. Uh, we will go uh, West African garden egg and we keep the seed from that. We grow our Mississippi brown butter bean. Um, so we are growing our traditional crops here at Sankofa, and then people at our markets get a chance to eat them, 
And then we also have a couple rows that we sow just for seed keeping. And then uh, other people throughout the country are then able to use those seeds. Um, and it's a really beautiful model. Uh, they also um, profit share with us in all the farms. So it is another way, especially when things get rough in nonprofit world, it's a way to, to have a little bit of shared, you know, to distribute your income across different areas. And we also, um, with True Love, each one of the seeds, and there's such a diverse variety of seeds, each seed has its own story and they're involved in, in keeping the seeds and the story. We can head to the next slide. Cool, so we got black eyed peas here. This is one of the seeds of the main crop that we grow. It's a West African um, uh, crop. It is an amazing crop. It produces so heavily. Um, we grow both a uh, purple hall pea and a crowder pea um, here, and we keep those, and they're in the True Love Seed catalog. Um, catalog. And uh, this is a deeply, uh, this is a, a crop that's deeply connected to, to Southern, the American South. Um, super nutritious for you, very high yielding. You can also eat the leaves. Um, we can head to the next one. Also, just like to say that also this is a, an opportunity. A lot of these seed stories, uh, white folks and black folks in the South all eat, because it's a regional dish, all eat those, those uh, and have stories around um, those different black eyed peas too. So that's a for example, when you start to tell the story, you got to start to see how uh, different people from different backgrounds also have those stories. When we talk about okra, we see East, um, we see Asian folks, we see um, African folks, we see Caribbean folks, uh, folks from the American South, all talking about how okra is in their life, right? So that's another way to really build relationships when you start to get into food and seeds. This is a Crowder pea. We don't have to spend too much, too, too, too long here. Thank you. Beautiful. Uh, we got some sorghum. This is another crop that we grow. Uh, this is an awesome crop. It's drought resistant. Um, you can use almost all parts of the plant. Um, we grow the coral variety that's on True Love Seed. Um, you can, we also press the canes for molasses. Uh, this is an a African um, uh, domesticated crop. And head next. All right, okra, this is one of the beautiful uh, seeds. This is an example of the seed story that we tell with this. Um, actually, okra, and I'm honored to tell this story, um, is uh, we tell it, we tell this, uh, we have a, a ceremony where we talk about okra with our students. Um, okra was one of the seeds that was sewn into the hair of uh, West African enslaved people um, as they headed uh, across the uh, Atlantic. Um, and this story really has been when we talk to our young people about stories that have affected them throughout their, li uh, throughout their lives and their, their time here at San Kofin at the farm, this connection to okra um, and that spiritual connection and the, the understanding of that people didn't know where they were going, they were hurt, but they knew that they wanted to have their cultural food and that that cultural food, um, given, given 400 years of um, oppression slavery, Jim Crow, um, segregation, mass incarceration, um, Black, Lives, you know, Black Lives Matter movement, um, through all of that, that people have kept their cultural tradition. They knew that they wanted to know and have their cultural crops. Um, it's had been a story that it's been, um, and I ask that you tell that story and learn more about that story. We can head to the next slide. This is a fish pepper. This is a really cool story. Uh, fish pepper is a super, super hot pepper grown in Philadelphia and uh, Baltimore. And uh, you can see right there that the ripe is red, but the, the white, the, there's also kind of a right before it turns, turns ripe, there's a, a white and green. Um, and actually this was used in Baltimore uh, catering companies for their fish sauce. Uh, so there wouldn't be flecks of, of red pepper or black pepper. Um, and so this is a very, it's an African-American cultivar. It was created and kind of used for that. Um, and we, it's one of the peppers that we grow. Next slide. This is the African rice that I was talking about earlier. Um, this rice was domesticated in Africa and West Africa. Um, and it is a highly nutritious dryland rice. Um, we're starting to grow it here in the United States, um, but also making sure that we tell that story. Next slide. We got the Paul Robeson tomato. 
Uh, Paul Robeson is a Philly, Philly, uh, Paul Robeson was a singer, he's an activist, musician, he's very, this is very interesting. He was, he was very popular in Russia and often, from my understanding is that the Russian botanists were very into these purple tomatoes. Um, and the, the Russian botanist actually um, named it the Paul Robeson tomato, made it all the way back to Philadelphia and we grow, it's a delicious tomato, delicious, 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 not extremely high yielding. Um, it's one of the ones that we keep. You can head to the next slide. Boom, okay, so this is one of the really cool ideas that we do. Uh, we have, uh, this is an example of a recipe card. We have about 10 of these. They're kind of like, ball, like uh, baseball cards. Um, this young woman, uh, her name is Yanka. Uh, this is an example of our connection to the community. Yanka worked with us for three years. She grew sweet potato green. It's a Liberian, uh, a staple in Liberian food. And uh, we have a high Liberian population here in Philadelphia. Yanka um, brought in the sweet potato green uh, and we grew it at the farm. We started selling it and then it was sold out every week because Liberian folks didn't have any other place to get organic, local, anywhere to get really fresh potato green and she also sh showed us and taught us and has taught us again and again how to make this uh, really amazing uh, sweet potato or potato green soup um, so this is one of those examples where you listen to the community it actually has influenced what we grow and our crop plant every year um, so we grow this it's been an awesome uh, we we are able to both sell the leaves and sell the roots um, and she is continuing to be and has been an awesome member of our community. Next slide. All right, how do we work with our community in uh, Southwest Philadelphia? So we have markets, our food goes right directly to uh, Market Red Hout here. We're next to the largest housing campus in Philadelphia. Um, it's about 800 people and we sell right there. Uh, we sell a huge bunch of collard greens for $1.50. Um, and people can make sure, make sure that it's affordable. We make sure that they can use their access cards if they need to. Um, and then also we have cooking uh, lessons going on right as we do our market. Um, we do our home garden bed program. Like I said, we work with school and rec center gardens. We established a local swag network, which is our Southwest and West agricultural network. So it's a group of farms um, and we kind of research, we're better, stronger together. And we have a tool library. We started a swag hot sauce. So there's some value added products. Um, it's been really, really good to get together and kind of share and kind of create a regional network of farms within West and Southwest Philadelphia. We are also guided by our elders council. Uh, so we have a group of elders that kind of guide the work that we do. They hold us accountable to our work. Um, and this is one of the ways that we are continually being intergenerational. Our cooking classes, we go and we teach cooking classes when COVID dependent. Um, and we also have big community meals um, and big community events like our Harvest Festival where uh, three years ago, we had about 2000 people come 90% um, of them were from here, right here in Southwest that come and are involved in a huge celebration here at the farm. Next slide. I wanna make sure that we have time for questions, so. Yeah, and Ty, I'm just gonna ask you one. Um, one of the questions, uh, are there any um, crops that you couldn't find in major seed companies and how did you go about ascertaining those varieties and what resources have been helpful during that process? And the person who is asking, Amy, it yeah. works with Yazidi farmers who are looking to rebuild their food shed, uh, I believe in perhaps Lincoln in Nebraska. Cool. Yeah. Um, the the community, as you would assume, the community of seed keepers is very small. Um, so if you do, like, I would just want to offer you up my contact um, and we can maybe post that after. If you have any follow up questions, I'm happy to, to connect you if you're having trouble finding certain things. Um, we also like so, tr I mean, True Love Seeds is a great way to go. There's some different uh, seed libraries, um, but I would get in touch with Owen Taylor or through me through Owen Taylor to find out if that variety that you're or those varieties that you're looking for are, are available. If not, um, what we generally do is we, we ask like um, the like different cultures. So we work like with uh, the Burmese population. Um, and they have uh, uh, they, a lot of folks in just in their backyards grow varieties of uh, 
rose, roselle or sour sour and so we've asked them if they feel comfortable uh to share their seeds with us and then we grow we help to grow them out making sure that they're distanced enough and we actually are starting to build our own food shed um with the proper techniques for seed for seed saving with this like certain distance so that there's not cross pollination and so forth but we we generally we do not um we do not try to like take seeds or like use seeds unless we're we have permission in the story that's like been really important to us so um a personal journey uh so i would just want to encourage you all um i was reading and researching a lot about iowa uh, and that actually a lot of the, my cultural background is I'm Swedish and Dutch um, and German. And a lot of those same cultural groups are the, the same folks that have settled Iowa. I want to encourage you, and, and it's kind of like a challenge for you. And one of the reasons, one of the ways that I've learned, and kind of this goes into working in a black community for me, and Chris, my co-director has really been pushing me to do this is to go back and understanding my history um, as a way to kind of dismantle whiteness uh, and white privilege in that, in that work in some ways, um, that I am not just a white person, but that not, not to not acknowledge that I have privilege, but to know that I am, I do come from these ancient traditions that also have stories. Um, one of the questions we often ask when people come to the farm is, as we're sitting in a circle is, What's your food, what's a food that connects to your culture? And often we go around and white people are like, they just say like pizza or they, there's no like connection to culture. And when you don't have a connection to culture, there is an, there, we, I have seen the, an emptiness and, an, and, an, and more ability to appropriate, um, more ability to kind of like look down on, potentially look down on other, other cultures as well. And so by kind of going back and understanding your culture and your cultural stories, it, it kind of starts to populate this, um, your history and your sense of self and identity in a way that then you're able to kind of share the stories of celebration and the stories of oppression that come with your people. Um, so it is a way going back and getting it is not, and Sankofa is not just for, for people of African descent, it is also for white people. And I have found it being extremely powerful. I wanna encourage you all um, to go back and do it through food. And I just recently did it through this thing, the Swedes. I, I learned that Swedes was, you know, is a rutabaga and I'm gonna be growing it this year. And like growing, I wanna encourage you to also grow your traditional crops. We can head to the next slide. So this is a challenge for you to go back and get it. I do have a few recommendations for community building. Um, like I said, it's all about relationships. It's not an easy thing to do, um, but it is a, is a, it's constant reflection. Um, it's constantly being open and honest about yourself. It's really about kind of really listening and creating systems for listening. Um, we've developed a community, uh, a grant for folks, a mini grant. So if people have ideas in the community about how they wanna incorporate food, they can get up to $500 and then they're, they're kind of creating their own idea um, and proposal in the community, which has been really cool. That's a great idea. Uh, we formed an elders board, hire young people, eat together um, and definitely make space for fun and celebration. Uh, I feel like those are some of my major, major tips. Um, and when it gets hard, conflict can really, it's like a broken bone. If you, if you set it right, it can make it stronger. Um, but when things come up and they will, because I found that working across, you know, working across cultural background, socioeconomic background, racial background is not easy. But in our country, this is the work that we need to do to dismantle, uh, you know, to dismantle the systems that have created inequity and to really fight for justice. And so, um, like I said earlier, I'm excited to be a resource for you all if I can. Um, if there are white folks out there that are working in communities of color or working in communities that are not their own, I'm, I'm a work in progress and learning and there's a bunch of people in Philadelphia that have a ton of resources. Um, and I'm here and I wanna help support that. Um, and yeah, if you have any questions, please let me know. It's been great to talk to you all. I wish I could be in front of you and see your faces. Um, but, uh, now's a great time for questions, Liz. Is, are we, how are we doing on time? Yeah, we have a few minutes left. Um, so I'm sure we'll get some more questions in the chat box. One okay. question that's here now is, uh, during COVID, um, what have been some, you know, adaptive community engagement strategies you've used? 
Awesome. Yeah. So uh, one of our biggest responses to COVID was to install home garden beds, uh, almost in this idea of victory gardens uh, so that people can, you know, when people are rushing to the grocery store, that they actually have and have a knowledge of their food and have food at home. Um, and so we, instead of installing 20 garden beds this year, we installed 60. And from that created online networks and workshops to be able to resource people. So we have tried to use technology to build relationships, um, but actually to get people growing at home has been one of our biggest responses. Um, and then having people come to the farm in small groups um, has been another way to connect people to the land. Um, those are some of the main, you know, some, some suggestions. Yeah, and Ty, earlier there was a photo <clears throat> of a, looked like maybe a, a three by five um, yeah. raised bed. So that's, that's the, the home garden bed you're talking about. Yeah, so and, we do a, oh, sorry, go yeah, ahead. go ahead. No, I was just saying we have a small, yeah, it's a small size. We have, we have two sizes, uh, small and large, four by eight, so larger. Okay, great. Yeah. And there's a question um, about, can you give examples of how to form an elders board and maybe some mm. tips on best practices? Yeah, so I think in doing this, this kind of came, came out organically through the community garden. Um, but uh, as people come to the market or and show initial interest, um, also to go, so, so we, that's some of how we recruited as like the elders that started to come uh, and kind of be attracted to the space whether that was through market or their community garden, those are the, some of the people that we asked. But we also try to not recreate the wheel and go to centers of power within the community. And so that looks like, uh, you know, schools, that looks like um, churches, mosques, um, and presenting there and then really calling for, if there are folks within the community that are already get, are doing good work, inviting them on the board so then you expand your network. Great. And we are about out of time. Uh, so Ty, I'll just ask you, do you have any final comments, um, words of advice you want to share with folks? Yeah, I just, like I said earlier, I want to encourage you to please uh, to do your own personal Sankofa and going back and getting it. And also um, to make sure that you're doing the research um, uh, around history of the communities that you're working in uh, and to listen fully. Um, and like I said earlier, I'm here as a resource and I hope this was helpful. Um, and thank you so much for your time. Yeah, and, and Ty, you're getting you're getting many thanks in the chat box. All right, so. whoop, whoop, whoop. So. come and visit us in Philly. <laughs>